Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Cassie Riva. I'm the events coordinator at an Unlikely Story bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. Before we start, here's a couple technical tips. Any questions you have for the authors can be written in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen or in the chat or in the Facebook comment section. If you'd like to buy the book, click the green button at the bottom of your screen and it'll take you to our website. And when you purchase Kristen Higgins' new book, Pack Up the Moon, from an unlikely story, you're going to receive a signed book plate from the author while supplies last. We've hosted Kristen Higgins at the bookstore several times, and each time she graces our stage, it's such a treat for the audience and our booksellers. And tonight, I am thrilled to introduce Kristen and Samia Dave to our virtual stage. Kristen Higgins is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 20 novels, which have been translated into more than two dozen languages and have sold millions of copies worldwide. Her books have received dozens of awards and have star reviews from Kirkus, the New York Journal of Books, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, People, and Booklist. Her books regularly appear on lists for best novels of the year, and Kristen is also a co-host of the Crappy Friends podcast, which discusses the often complex dynamics of female friendships with her friend and fellow writer, Joss Day. She lives in Connecticut with her husband, two children, and a few badly behaved pets. Kristen's new book, Pack of the Moon, is a sometimes heartbreaking, but overall uplifting novel about a woman with a terminal illness who leaves a letter for her husband each month that contains a task to help him face the first year without her. In this novel, Kristen illuminates how life's greatest joys are often hiding in plain sight. Samia Dave is a writer, psychiatrist, and mental health advocate. Her debut novel, Well-Behaved Indian Women, was featured in the New York Times Book Review, L, Bustle, BuzzFeed, and more. Samia's essays, articles, and poetry have been in outlets including the New York Times, ABC News, Refinery29, and HuffPost, among others. Samia and her husband Samir founded This Is For Her, a nonprofit which uses art therapy to improve mental health awareness and education for women and girls in low and middle income countries. Samia is a practicing therapist as well as an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai, where she teaches narrative medicine. And her newest novel, What a Happy Family, comes out on June 22nd, and you can pre-order it by clicking that green button below. Kristen and Samia, thank you so much for joining us today. We've been so excited for this event. Oh, thank you. It's so great to be here. Thank you. And just let's get it right out of the way I've read such a happy family or what a happy what a happy family and it's so good and it's so juicy and delicious with all sorts of family intrigue and nuance and battles and i loved it so <laughs> oh thank you so much you know kristen i have loved all of your books really and and just for everyone here to know so i met kristen two years ago at a berkeley party i think the last berkeley party that we know of before everything shut down of course and i was about four and a half months pregnant really not feeling well and very nervous to approach Kristen because I <laughs> looked up to her for so long, just loved her work. And another author actually connected us and said, just say hi to her, she's so nice. And I have to tell everyone here that I think the coolest thing that can happen is, is meeting someone whose work you love and then just seeing that they are just such a fantastic and warm person. Um, within minutes, Kristen comforted me about my pregnancy and <laughs> all the anticipation I had about becoming a mom and entering this new phase of life. So it was such a treat. Um, you know, for years, I've loved your books because the characters always feel so real. And last summer, I read Always the Last to Know, and I just loved the women and the dynamics between the women. And I wanted to start off by asking about your characters in this book. So how did Lauren and Josh come to you? Well, um, I I love love stories, you know, and um, and I think this, I wanted to write an epic love story. Um, you know, I've written romance and women's fiction, and then I was just, I felt ready to take on this, this big, beautiful, sad, redemptive story of this couple. Um, so I was up here on Cape Cod, and uh, my dog Luther, who's somewhere in the background, um, we were walking on the beach, and it was really really cold um and uh, like i was like we were going to die soon let's hurry up luther he had his little coat on i had a park on and we're just walking along hustling to the car and i saw this guy um maybe 100 or 200 yards away and he was at the ocean's edge 
and you know it's like 12 degrees in february wind is blowing and he didn't have a hat on his dark hair was blowing and he was just staring out at the ocean and i immediately thought that guy's lost somebody because mm. he looks so heartbroken and you know i'm a course already extrapolating you know he's probably like thinking i wonder if the bass are running or something. <laughs> sure writer love it, Just love it. Right. for me yeah. I lost someone and he was yeah. a tragic figure and and also a very handsome figure um and so i thought i'm gonna write his story and and that was that was it and sometimes the universe just kind of like drops a little seed in your lap for mm -hmm. a book. And this was one of those times, you know, I, I often get those seeds like eavesdropping or, or, um, you know, a friend will tell me a story and I'll think, Oh, that would make a great book. But for this one, it was just that visual of this, this solitary man. So I finished the book. I was writing always the last to know. Um, and I, I started thinking, you know, I'm going to write a tragic, beautiful love story because people die young right and and it does happen and and it's hard sometimes to look at a, a young couple with with this kind of thing hanging over their heads so i i loved the challenge of it but mostly i wanted to write their love story you know and so i one of my rules of thumb for writing a book is um you have a task in front of you, pick the person least equipped to tackle the task as your hero. Ooh. So, you know, cause that'll make it interesting for the reader. So I make this, this guy who's um, kind of a loner, definitely a loner. He, um, he works by himself, for himself. He needs very little from the outside world because he's a super genius millionaire, super successful. Um, even by the time he's 20, he's already sold patents and, you know, but all he cares about is his work. He has, he's the single, he's got a single mom. He's an only child. So his world is very small. And um, enter Lauren, who is his complete opposite. She is bouncy and extroverted and outgoing. And um, their first exchange when they meet in college is less than pleasant. Um, they they take it like an instant dislike to each other. And he's not won over by like her golden retriever puppy kind of approach. And he, and, um, and she's just sort of insulted. Like, I'm so charming though. Like everybody likes me. Everybody likes me. Yes. Everybody does like her. <laughs> <laughs> everybody likes Lauren. And, um, and then they meet again a few years later and they connect. And I, I loved the idea that Lauren, who is so full of life, kind of brings Josh to life mm -hmm. through their courtship and their marriage um, and and exposes him to this new world. It's like that moment in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy opens the door and there's all this color. And um, and that was Josh, Josh's experience with Lauren. And then, of course, she, she gets this tragic terminal diagnosis and she realizes he's going to be lost without me in a way that like every widower is going to be lost. But, but Josh, Josh is sort of, I keep saying Joss because she's my friend. Joshua is um, really going to be lost. He's on the spectrum. He has trouble connecting with people, you know, reading social cues. Uh, he has a few friends, but they're far flung. He's got his mom, he's got his next door neighbors and, and then Lauren brings him into this beautiful, rich world filled with flowers and babies and, you know, sunshine. And then she's diagnosed. And so his task at first is to save her, right? He wants mm -hmm. to, like, I want to save my wife. I'm, I'm a medical engineer. This is my thing. I do. I'm going to invent something really fast. Um, and he, he doesn't. And, uh, and so she does die. But she knows that he's still going to need her. And in what I think is an act of such a beautiful love she prepares him for her death and for being without her by writing him a letter for each month of the first year of his widowhood giving him a job to put him out in the world pull him out of his comfort zone start to meet other people start to adapt to life without her Oh, those letters, the letters. Um, I actually, I really wanted to ask you about the letters because 
you know, in the mental health community, we talk about grief so much, of course. And, and of course, there are those stages that we go through when we're grieving, but, but there's actually a big call to think about those stages and about that idea that everybody's healing process and the way they navigate grief can, can look different. It can look different for them. And I saw that reflected actually in the way you wrote this book. Um, I loved the letters and I loved the way you jumped around in time to really give us a sense of this relationship. So did you always know you wanted to do that? Did did you know you wanted to jump around in time that way and use letters in that way for the story? Um, I I did, yeah. The my idea of of a widower being sort of led through that year by his late wife um, was so appealing um, and and so necessary for Joshua. And the idea of telling her story backwards. So you know, we start mm -hmm. knowing that Lauren has a terminal illness and that her time is winding right. down. And so in chapter two, she's gone, N not a plot spoiler, but her story is told from that moment backwards to when she, she first meets Joshua and realizes this is the one for me. Um, and I wanted to do that because it, it would have been too hard, I think, to read about them from the start. And then her story ends with her death. So I wanted her story to end with this moment of of excitement and connection and like the whole possibility of the future mm -hmm. for her and Josh. And then Joshua's story goes from her funeral through that first year. Right. Um, and his story too ends at such a moment where he's poised at the brink of something big and beautiful and full of color um, that, you know, Lauren has, has succeeded in mm -hmm. guiding through that year. Um, so both stories, both narratives end very happily and very full of love, which is why, you know, the story definitely has its sad moments because I'm a very emotional person and I love an emotional story. Nothing makes me happier than sobbing over a fictional character. <laughs> and there are definitely those scenes in the book where you're yes. like, oh, yeah. Kristen, you broke me. Um, but I will put you back together. And that's the, the sort of joy of writing this kind of book is to examine grief, how it doesn't move in a straight line. Yes. Um, you know, um, it, you can wake up one day after losing someone and say, like, you know what, I feel it pretty good today. I guess I guess I'm over it. And then, you know, half an hour later, you can be crying in the shower. <laughs> you know? So true. There yeah. can be such a back and forth and days can be different. Hours can be different. And that that is reflected in the book, I think. Mm -hmm. So honestly, it really is. And yeah. I, grief is something that's come up so much over the past year and a half for all yeah. of us. You know, I feel like I'm reading about it still all the time. But there are also moments of hope. And I think there are moments that we've all held on to that we want to take with us in the years going mm -hmm. forward from the pandemic. I was wondering while I read this, because last summer I read your book, Always Last to Know, loved it, excited for your future books. And this book, you wrote it primarily during the pandemic, yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, I had the idea very well formed. I was mm. I was getting close to the end. Um, I actually came up here to Cape Cod to my family's little house. Mm. Isn't it cute? <laughs> Very cute. Um, uh, and I was like, I'm going to finish this book. And then, like, the pandemic made the news. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, we were, it was March. And so we finally kind of like locked down as a society. And my husband's a firefighter. My daughter is a nurse. Um, my son is a college student. And um, so they're all very much at risk and I was in my safe little bubble up here with the dog and they said um don't come home you just mm. like, stay there for now because we don't really know how this is going to progress and like if they're going to my frontline workers are going to get it so suddenly for the first time ever I was alone not by choice um you know it's really fun to go away and write when that's your choice but when your family says yeah you should just like we don't have a date for you to come home just stay there and you know figure it out <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and in the winter is very quiet and 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 um gray so and then i'm thinking oh i've written a story about loss and um how will that be received um but i also felt maybe this we, we need this book right now mm -hmm. we need to be able to 
let our emotions out. It's like we've been holding our breaths for a year and a half. And um, I was um, being interviewed by a a journalist in Arizona and she said, I I used to cry easily and then the pandemic hit and I just like had to keep everything together because I have kids and, you know, husband, parents and, you know, you just had to keep everything so tightly clenched. And then she said, I, I kind of felt like I, I had scar tissue over my heart because like mm. we were people and know people and and um and then I read your book and I was I was just like lying on my bed at this one scene and just crying and it just felt so good <laughs> to let it out. Yeah. So I think it's a very healing book, not just for Josh, but for every reader. And the feedback that I've gotten is like, thank God you wrote this book, you know, and and um I and I cried and you know, I, I I have all these tissues around me, but I'm so happy now. You know, now now that it's over, <laughs> now that I got to the ending, which I think is a very beautiful and hopeful ending. I agree. I found it so hopeful. And for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, please keep a box of tissues. Um, if you wear eye makeup, maybe it should be waterproof. <laughs> this is a tip. But I just, I'm so excited for more and more readers to get this in their hands because I agree, it felt very cathartic reading it and crying because that scar tissue analogy was perfect. I think there's been a sort of numbness over everyone as a way to cope with everything going on. You know, one of the things that also struck me, I loved Lauren and Josh and their love was just portrayed so beautifully and it was so moving. I also really loved everyone else in the book. So I loved Lauren's relationship with her dad and how we actually get a sense of that Mm -hmm. through her letters um, and then her best friend and then both of their families of origin. How did you, up with the worlds that these characters came from? Well, um, I wanted Lauren to have some event that would make her mature a little Mm -hmm. more quickly than your average 23, 24 year old um, when she meets Joshua. Um, One of the things that he notices about her when she's 19 or 20 and she approaches him at a party is, you know, she's kind of shallow and confident and relying on how pretty she is to make friends. And because he's on the spectrum, he just sort of announces that as his read on her. You know, like you expect people to like you because you're pretty, but you know, what else is there? And um, and he, she's really insulted. And, but in order for her to, to grow up enough to face the challenge of her diagnosis, I figured she needed a loss. So mm-hmm. that was her dad. And my dad died when I was about Lauren's age, uh, when she loses her dad. And um, and he was also a great dad. And, you know, the idea of her writing to him as a way to, to feel his presence, I thought was really, really lovely. I didn't do that um, when I lost my dad, but I, I loved that she thought, you know, my time with my father is not done. So I'm going to keep writing letters to him to feel close to him, to kind of check in, almost like she being accountable to her dad. Is she living the life that he would have wanted for her? Is she living life with her whole heart, which was his advice to her? And um, so I, I loved him. And I think that gave her this kind of maturity about um, about life. You know, people die Mm -hmm. and without warning sometimes and tragedies happen what are you going to do with them how are you going to learn from them and um i i have written so many books where sisters have friction Mm -hmm. um i wanted to write a book where the sisters absolutely adore each other and so uh her her sister jen is one of my favorite characters she's uh, lauren calls her super jen because she's just like everything comes so easily. She says she's mom's favorite, but I totally understand why I'm like right there with mom, <laughs> you know, Lauren, Jen is best. We, we have not, um, and she has a, a, a little nephew whom she's a, she adores. One of the things that I wanted to show in the story um, was that not everybody rises to the occasion. Mm when you have a difficult situation, a loss or a diagnosis in this case. And some of the people who rise to the occasion, like like Lauren's friend, Sarah, are kind of a surprise. Sarah wasn't the greatest friend. <laughs> and um, she had a, a, she has an edge to her. She kind of, she rubs 
you know, a little harshly on purpose. But when Lauren is diagnosed, she becomes a fantastic friend. And um, and like Lauren's mom, her first words about pound hearing that her daughter has this diagnosis is like, how could you do this to me? Which I know my mom doesn't have the techno technological ability to tune in. <laughs> that is my classic mother. Recently, you know, <laughs> like, what? I, how could you do this to me? You, you my heart. I'm already heartbroken. You know. Um, so she was fun to write too. You she know? was fun to read. Yeah, yeah. she was yeah. fun. And um, and then I loved um, I loved Joshua's mother Stephanie, yes. the, yes. A, the single mom, who um, is is very together very capable, very brilliant herself. And their next door neighbors are uh, Ben and Sumi Park, um, a Korean couple. And they kind of adopt Josh as like their fifth child. And um, and Mrs. Kim teaches him to cook. So he loves Korean food, as do I, um, as does everyone. <laughs> and uh, Ben becomes his father figure. So there's a lot of like, there's the family of origin, and there's the family of choice, um, which I think is true for, for everybody, you know? Absolutely, and I think you showed that so well because when you said the point about the sisters and that being an effortless bond and they knew their roles and they knew how they were seen by their mom, I actually thought of how well you captured that idea of envy between Sarah and Lauren because that's something that's often not discussed in books openly and I really liked that we saw that that in female friendships there can be that envy but there can be an ownership of that envy and that right. can be okay and that's right. why I have that exactly you know and and um you know Lauren has a very charmed life up until she's 20 um you know where things come easily to her and she gets into her top choice school and everybody loves her and then there's she's pretty yeah uh, the other friend yeah. you know who's who doesn't have such a wonderful family and and um, who has to make more sacrifices and um, and I do I love that scene where where Sarah admits like she was jealous she was jealous, it was yeah. hard to have Lauren as a friend I, I was Lauren's friend that was my identity you know and and she I think she comes into her own in the book um, oh, yes. pretty well and you know and uh, and she's not perfect and she's not like cuddly the way Lauren is and um they they've been friends since they were children and I think there's such a value on a friendship where you've grown up with someone and you share yeah. their history and and their experiences but they don't always last you know those friendships and and I think maybe because of of the podcast that Joss and I do where we discuss friendships and often like friendships that may have run their course and how hard it is for us women to let go of them. Um, I really wanted to do that kind of friendship of like, are we done being friends? Like mm. it's really working for both of us anymore. And then Lauren's father dies and Jen rises to the occasion. She loved her, she loved Lauren's dad as well. And, um, and, and really comes through as a friend and their dynamic starts to even out. I love that. I love how we see the evolution of her. And I agree. I liked the way we ended with her. She, I really liked, I liked her a lot. Um, I thought she was a very interesting character with a lot of substance. And I think we all know someone like that. Yeah, yeah. You know? She was familiar, just like all your characters are familiar. She gets stuff done, you know? She does. She, she's yeah. the person you would want around in a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, that's who I would want. I, I also really enjoyed reading the different settings in the book. They truly came alive. And I think during a year when we've been isolated and maybe not able to travel so much, I felt like I went to different places. So I'd love to just know more about that. You know, whether it was the beach, Turks and Caicos, how did you put those beautiful places in the book? Yeah, one of the um, nice things about uh, Joshua is he's extremely wealthy yeah. and extremely hot um, because, you know, you want the, that bit of escapism in the story oh, as well. So, um, you know, Lauren's, Lauren's not doing badly herself, but then she marries this guy with, with like, he has no idea how much is in his bank account because it doesn't matter, but they are able to have a very comfortable life. So they go to Hawaii on their honeymoon and they stay in Kauai, which is oh, where my family and I stayed a few years gorgeous. ago. Um, and they, um, they're able to take a vacation to the islands and they live in Providence, Rhode Island, which um, I know a couple of the people here tonight are from Providence. And I went to Providence College for a year um, 
and that's that's where I met one of my very best friends in the world, um, who is not on the event tonight, but she's doing yoga. But her sister is also <laughs> <my friend. laughs> so um, she's like, "Oh, Elizabeth will be in the chat tonight, but I have yoga." <laughs> it's that dedication. Love it. <laughs> Love it. She's, I'm sure she's tuned into a few others. Um, but I love the city. Providence is like this little jewel between Boston and New York. And most of us drive past it to get somewhere else. But it's it's like the best kept secret of the East Coast. It's it's a legitimate city. It's got beautiful parks, an incredible historic district, and it's packed with colleges. So there's always art and music and interesting talks and all the businesses that feed off a college environment. So um, I loved putting them in Providence and um, I got to go back and walk around with Catherine and, and you know revisit some old places. And then of course, um, a part of it is set on Cape Cod, which is my heart's home, you know, and um, uh, I took advantage of that winter that I spent renting a little house overlooking the ocean yeah. and, and made the house much more fabulous for Lauren and Josh and, um, but put it in the same spot so they could hear the waves and have the family up and play on the beach and stuff. That so I, I love to do that with books to give my readers that mental vacation, you know, and, and inundate them with all the sensory stimulation of the, the seagulls and the fried clams and the lobster rolls and, um, you know, all that stuff, the chocolates. <laughs> oh, that was great. I think there was one description of the book um, or of the, of the house in Cape Cod and it had multi-level decks overlooking the water. I just thought that sounds like a dream. I mean, how peaceful is that? And she would drink her coffee in the morning and sit there and it just sounded so peaceful. I just yeah. it really helped transport me to another place. So again, readers, I'm so excited for anyone who hasn't met these wonderful characters yet because you'll just be taken in all sorts of great journeys with this. Do we have time for one more question between us? I think we do. Well, I would, yeah. And I would love to ask you a question. Oh, sure. About your book. Sure. Um, readers and listeners, I got an early copy. Is it Samia or yes. Samia? Samia. Samia. Perfect. Um, it's hard when you're- No, reading, no, no. Thank you, you for know. asking. No, I appreciate <laughs> it. So, um, she wrote Well Behaved Indian Women and then What a Happy Family. And I loved What a Happy Family because it's got the two sisters, it's got the parents who have this very interesting dynamic, you know, all the focus on the children and what are you doing and why aren't you more like your sister? And, you know, um, you know, when are you gonna have babies and, and why aren't you engaged to this guy? And I loved it. I mean, it the culture the cultural aspect was so rich and so accessible, you know, to to me, not an Indian, but just as a woman in a family, um, I loved, I, like I felt like it was my family too. Oh. And all those pressures and expectations um, and like the secret allies that you make, the way the characters kind of turn, it, it's brilliant. And oh, it's, you like, family drama, and we all do, or else we wouldn't. Yeah. Um, this is a great book and you can pre-order it uh, from Unlikely Story. I'm pretty sure you're in the links there too. So go ahead and click that green bar and order that because it was just a very engrossing read. Oh, so, thank you. Well <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That means the world coming from you, really. I appreciate that a lot. We have time for one more. I just had a, like, out of curiosity, I was wondering, how did you come to you know the pulmonary fibrosis and what was that like because you know as a medical professional the way you captured it was just very real really um and i think we really got a perspective of what it's like for someone to navigate the daily grind of something like that you know whether it's thinking about oxygen and energy levels and, and even her fatigue um i think there was one part where she talked about how she needed to take a nap after doing things that before she wouldn't have had to even think twice about like taking a walk and things like right. that and right. yeah that was just so it's, so vividly portrayed it's an evil disease mm -hmm. and um one of the great things about writing this book is that i i do have you know the ability to reach a lot of people and so idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF is um, a lung disease that kills more people than heart attacks in the United States. But it's often categorized as like an old person, former smokers disease. Right. 
but it's not idiopathic means we don't know why you have this. Am I right? <laughs> In medically, he's like, sorry, we don't know why this struck. Um, but so um, I was doing the research. I, I, I wanted it to be a terminal illness, you know, because that's the point of the story. Um, I didn't want it to be cancer because there's so many books about cancer out there. And um, so I was doing some research about you know, terminal diagnoses and I came across a website, uh, Pulmonary Fibrosis News, and there was a young woman blogging on it. And she was talking about what it's like to be under 30 years old and have this kind of disease where it often can make you feel old before your time. Or, you know, you do have to like think, how badly do I really have to go to the bathroom? You know, like, is it worth the trip? Or mm -hmm. um, do, do I, you know, I have to go upstairs, you know, let me, let me have 20 more minutes on the couch before I can manage that. Um, it's, I think it's one of those cruel diseases that takes you bit by bit. And yet it's also um, a disease that is manageable for a large part of it. You know, there's there's treatment out there. And so my friend Charlene, um, who's now my friend, um, and I dedicated the book to her because I don't think I could have written it without her. I, you know, I was thinking like, oh, poor Charlene, you know, she has this diagnosis. I wonder if she would be interested in sharing some things with me. So I emailed her and she wrote back and she's like, I'm so excited about this idea. But right now I'm about to go snorkeling. I'm in Hawaii and I'm later going to be like swimming with dolphins. So I'll email you when I get back <laughs> to Toronto. I love it. And I was like, wow, you know, so it's, showing like you can have a terminal disease and still have a great time, a lot mm -hmm. of adventures, you know, you don't bury me yet kind of thing. Um, and one of the things that I like to do in the book was the stupid things people say to someone who, mm. you know, has an oxygen tank or um, is in a scooter. Um, I have a, a cousin who uses a wheelchair and she's like, I just wish people would stop asking me um, why I have it or making like cute little jokes mm -hmm. like, oh don't break the speed limit in that you know and just mm -hmm. like it's a wheelchair like get right, over just it. stop <laughs> yeah yeah um, or people who don't like they're just like well maybe it'll be a breakthrough and you won't die and my favorite of all I could get hit by a bus tomorrow I mean we're all dying right <sighs> Um, and Lauren's like, what is it with people and these bus drivers? The bus, <laughs> so with the bus driver. She bus has drivers a are generally nice well, people, right? Um, well, even the moment um, that you captured about the other couple paying for their meal on vacation and that inciting anger, that was just so raw and real because it can bring up those those emotions where you know somebody might not know the right thing to say or do. But but I think a story like this just gives us more empathy and awareness that we don't always know what other people are carrying and we don't know what their day-to-day -day life is like when they're navigating something like this. We don't know the highs or the lows. And we right. really get such a sense of that with Warren and with Joshua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone, you know, like they say, everybody, you never know what someone is dealing with so true. when you run into them. And, um, uh, you know, I think that like with Lauren, she's so open about it and so good about it. Um, and most people in her life are, are so supportive and wonderful. Her wonderful boss, Bruce, um, who like makes an office with a bed in it so she can right. yeah. and, um, and then she has a coworker who's like already angling for her office, you know, like, how oh, much longer you at Lauren? Cause I, I've got plans for that office down the hall. Um, and um, uh, one of their friends uh, who like virtue signals about how caring she is because, you know, hashtag praying for Lauren but she never drops a meal off or anything like that. You know, she's never actually helpful. She right. just to say like, I have a friend who's sick and aren't I a good person? Right. So I loved exploring all those um, real life aspects of, of things that happen when, when somebody has a condition that makes people uncomfortable. They were very real, that performative kind of empathy in the show and all, all of those uh, nuggets were really, really vividly captured in the book, really. I, I want to be just mindful of the time um, and just make sure if if we want to go over to questions, I'm happy to do whatever works best. If anyone has any questions, you can write them right here in the chat. So if you have more questions, you can. Yes. 
them and I'll, I'll filter them in. Yes, so you know the idea of healing and the ways mm -hmm. we heal and what healing looks like, it's also captured just so nicely through the book with different characters too, which I, I loved. Did you learn anything new about the idea of healing as you were writing this? I was wondering what was going through Kristen's head about, about healing in general? You know, I've, I've had two profound losses in my life and I have not lost a partner. Um, and, um, but I, I drew a lot on my own experiences of feeling so isolated um, and, and like wanting to grab someone and shake them and say like, don't you know what could happen to you? Um, and uh, um, one of my favorite scenes is a very short scene in the book, but um, it's the middle of the night. Josh can't sleep. He doesn't want to wake anyone up. So he calls Apple support oh, I to just I talk to someone in the middle oh. of the night. He, he pretends yeah. he's having computer problems so that he can talk to nice Rory. And um, he says he's from Hawaii, right? Here he says he's in Hawaii at the time. Yeah, he doesn't plan on spinning yeah. this story, but Roy says, where are you from? And he yeah. says, Hawaii. And yeah. for like a half an hour, he gets to be not a guy who's a widower. He's some guy who's living in Hawaii with his lovely wife. And and um, and they talk about national parks. Yeah. And it's it, like he gets to step out of his life for a little while. Um, and I, I just remember like the relief of, like I would go to a movie by myself because you know, no one there would know and be sad. Um, and and I didn't have to be, you know, the person whose dad died or the, uh, you know, the person who, who whatever. Um, so um, it, it's always very hard. I think when you lose somebody and um, you run into like, you're, you're, you're doing okay. And then you run into someone who's, who's like nice to you. And then it just yeah. breaks you, you know? Yeah. Um, there's like a, another scene in the book where Josh goes to the um, grocery store. That's his first task from Lauren, go to the grocery store. And he's so excited because he didn't know he was going to have these letters. And now he has something to do and his wife wants him to do it. It's like she's sitting right there with him. So she sends him to the market and he's just like on this adrenaline high and he's running through the aisles, throwing stuff in his cart. And then he runs into her uh, Lauren's favorite employee at that stop and shop, shop. Yolanda. Yolanda, and um, and she says, "How's your wife doing?" And she so she doesn't know. And Josh, you know, just he's like, she's gone, and and she's so nice. She hugs him, and and he and then he realizes like I have all these groceries. I don't have any money, and she's like, "I got it. Don't worry." You know, and th those little kindnesses can can be so powerful and so meaningful and so difficult you know so difficult. Um, even though people are being great you know and one of my friends recently had a loss and and we were like i won't look at you if you don't look at me and then we won't cry you know <laughs> and um yes. uh, you, know, you know it's it's you're just so raw at that moment and i you know as as the letters progress, the jobs get harder and more um, meaningful, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They're not all perfect. And I, I I, wanted to do that too, to be realistic. Like, you know, Lauren can't always think of something exactly right that's so profound. Right. She's not psychic. Um, so some of the tasks are not as fun, but um, when, when they are fun um, or, you know, when they don't seem to be that important and then Josh finds some meaning in it, it's such a, an uplifting thing for him, you know? And um, there's one, t I mean, he thinks like, I need a hobby. I, I gotta do something. I need, I need to get out and meet people. And that's her, what her letter says that month. And he's like, oh my God, I was thinking the same thing, honey, you know? And, and um, you know, just like a sign from, the great beyond that you know she's still with him and they're still on that that level that felt like that a lot that it was a sign from the great beyond that they were so intuitively connected that she knew what he would need um yeah. which goes into why she you know wrote these letters for him in the first right. place and and that really does come across so well yeah i really i feel like you know she um 
she brings him back to life, you know, she and does. he was so good to her as a, as a boyfriend, as a husband. It sounds like a perfect husband. He was, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and I, one of the things that I've said is this is not, this is a story of how to be married too. Yeah. This is a beautiful example of why marriage can work so beautifully and be so important um, because, you know, they have fights and, and upset and irritations, but, um, but they take care of each other. They put each other first. Like, what does she need today? What does he need today? Those are their first thoughts. And um, and I do think that they just, they have the most beautiful relationship. And writing Josh on the spectrum was fun because like some of the things that he does for her, um, he has flowers sent to her office every Monday. And she's like, who is this man, right? <laughs> but, um, um, you know, it eases her into the work week after their happy weekends, but also, you know, it's something he can schedule, <laughs> you know, yes, that's so true. Impulsive and I don't, you know, like she won't, she won't wonder if I give her flowers every Monday, like I can just check that box, you know, <laughs> schedule that in. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're, they're a normal married couple. They have their spats before, during, you know, her illness and everything. Um, but I just like the, the love they have for each other. I think, I feel like this book shimmers with it. You know, oh it's God. just, it's a, it's a very beautiful love story. And, and even though it's sad, like you, people go through this and, um, and it, it really like lifts you up at the end. You, you never get over the loss of somebody that's, you know, ridiculous to think yeah. that but you get stronger and you get better at carrying it and and then carrying it becomes a gift that you have the memory of the person with you all the time and it's not it's not hurtful and it's not a burden anymore and um and i i think that if you can have that happen to you go through your grieving period, punch holes in the walls, do what you need to do, but then have their legacy be, not that they died, but that they lived. I mean, what more profound statement could there be? Absolutely, and no spoilers, of course, but but by the end of the book, I, I do think that we feel that way for them, and it's such a nice way to to end their story on that page, it really, it really is. It's so moving. I'm getting kind of emotional thinking about it. Well, I don't have my tissues here, um, but really, it's just it's so moving. Um, you know, to switch gears a little bit, when you talked about Josh being hot and rich, um, plus plus for all of us readers out there. <laughs> Again, you have, huh? What'd you say? Escapism, like yes, yes, exactly what we needed, uh, especially over the past year. Did you have any visions of who would play them in? screen version of the story. Yeah, I um I I always need that visual Ooh. for my my male protagonist, my my love interest, you know, I like to have a face. And for Josh, um although his um biological heritage doesn't support this, I pictured Henry Golding. I did too. I was about to say Henry yeah. Golding. Oh, yes. I love him and yes. you know he's such a talented actor and he's just so appealing, you know, yes. and, he and he looks really sweet. I'm acting like I know him, but I mean, he looks I like a nice guy. Right. He he's such yeah. a, he is. He's, he's the nicest guy ever. He is. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, I loved the idea of him and it just, I don't know if this is true for you, Somia, but like to have that face helps when you write the story. Yeah. So you can kind of picture like, what does it look like when he smiles? What does it look like when he frowns? You know, is it time to watch another Henry Golding movie? Yes. I think it is. I think I think on that note, I, that's exactly what I will do tonight after my <laughs> toddler goes to bed. Uh, no, absolutely. I, I pictured Henry Golding as well because yeah. I think he has that sweet, handsome, I, I don't think anybody can debate that he's handsome and just looks like a nice guy. There's something yeah. about his style where he just looks very nice. How about for Lauren? For Lauren, um, there's an actress named Madeline Pesh from okay. Riverdale, I think. Okay, and she's okay. This beautiful, bouncy redhead. Um, she kind of looked exactly the way I pictured Lauren. Um, I don't usually focus so much on the females' faces, mm -hmm. um, but um, when like looking for something to kind of 
give my readers a, a, an idea, I found her and I was like, oh yeah, she would be great. She'd be perfect. Um, that's just how I pictured her. And then of course, um, the dogs are very important. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I had a dog in 20 of my 21 novels and um, had a cat in the other one. Um, and uh, I've run out of my own dogs to use. So now I ask, my readers like it's time for me to find a dog pitch me your dog and <laughs> you know and 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 i try to find the right dog for the situation and the couple or the you know the person which dog would Ooh. this person choose and um so i just scroll through hundreds and hundreds of people love to offer up their dogs oh i love that wait so do you go by the the look or the temperament of the dog how does how does that work that's fascinating yeah sometimes it's like their description of the dog mm. um i i thought for for lauren she would want like um a really cuddly dog um mm -hmm. a silky dog um you know a really good couch companion and um a small enough dog like who could sleep with them in with bed. her yeah right <laughs> Um, so I just, um, I just kept reading comments until Pebbles, um, leaped out at me. And so my, my reader, Becky offered up Pebbles and sent me pictures and kind of told Aww. me about her personality and things she does. And, and that's such a, like a, it's a fun thing for the reader to, to be able to say, like, my dog is in this book. You know? I was just about to say, you made Becky's year, I bet, by I did that. send her an early yeah. call. So she, oh, she, that's so exciting! <laughs> Wait, so did, did you did you put that casting call out on Twitter or Instagram or where can we yeah, find I this for, for the next book? I usually do it in my. I have a uh, readers group, Kristen Higgins oh, Super, um, and Ooh. it's like a little bit more chatty on Facebook, a little bit more um, like girlfriends hanging around, um, and then I have oh, uh, another Facebook page for um, for fun. <laughs> Oh, that's, I love that. That's okay. I'm going to be signing up for that too before I watch my Henry Golding movie. So thank you for planning out my next 24 hours. Um, really. Are you reading anything interesting or compelling at the moment? Yes, I am. And I was prepared. Um, incense and Sensibility. Oh, love. Sonali yes, Blade. Um, she's, so she, she's such a magical writer. So really she is. has a um, Jane Austen series um, mm -hmm. set in contemporary time based around the Raj family of California, San Francisco. And um, they're extremely wealthy. So that's super fun to, to like be in these houses with this family, with all the aunties and the cousins and everyone's a cousin or a brother or sister, you know, it's just like this mob of people all the time. And um, in this book um, we have, the candidate for California's governor, Yoshi, and he's um, has a traumatic event happen at one of his events, um, his campaign events, and so he's like turned over to this um, this like stress manager to the stars, India, and she's a um, thank you, Fran. It's so nice of you. Yeah. I'm I'm doing an interview, but yeah, you could just leave it. <laughs> My neighbor came over. Oh, hello. <laughs> Which is very sad to see her going. Oh, come back. Um, so, um, so uh, India is this um, yoga teacher, and um, she's so confident of who she is, and she knows her strength so well. And so the hero is kind of this mess at this point, going through what he's gone through with all the pressures of of his his run for governor, his family. He's like the pride and joy of the family. And um, the dynamic between them is electric and really? so wonderful. I I'm I love it. Um, oh, she's a great writer. I'm so excited yeah. to read that. And I just love that she is doing the Jane Austen titles yeah. with such a like wink and a nod. And he's yeah. last Miss Dashwood, you know, it's just <laughs> perfect. Um, so um, I love I love Sonali's books, and I, I will be doing an event with her next month for that book. And then I have um, When Stars Collide by Susan Elizabeth Ooh. Phillips, which is um, one of her Chicago stars books. And she's just so funny and so sharp. Um, so that's just pure pleasure reading, you know, very, very wonderful. She's a smart, fast, hilarious writer, but she has a lot of 
a lot of depth in her books too, you know, um, it's not fluff, right? Um, and then I've read some amazing books this year. At the pandemic, like that was one of the secret gifts of the pandemic was I listened to a lot of books because I was alone so much um, and I didn't just want to have the TV on all the time. So I would mm -hmm. listen to, um, to books. I listened to um, The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna, uh, uh, yes. whose email I sometimes get since our names yeah. are close. <laughs> People say like the nightingale was the best book I've ever read in my life. I'm like me too, and I will tell Kristen how much you liked it. Um, the other Kristen, um, I loved the Four Winds. That was that was a, an incredible journey, and it's about a period of history that I don't know a lot about: the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. and the Great Western Migration of all these farmers whose farms were reduced to sand. Mm -hmm. um, it's so vividly written and I, I loved it. And, um, and I'm also um, listening to um, a really funny medical memoir called This Is Going to Hurt by Adam Kay, who's a Ooh. doctor in the National Health Service in Britain. And he's so irreverent and so honest about like how unqualified these baby doctors are because in Great Britain, you don't go to college and then medical school. Right. You just go right into being a doctor, right, right. from college. Like, I think I'd like to be a doctor. Okay. And then you <laughs> need it out. Um, and uh, it, it was hilarious. It was so funny. Um, so that's that, those are some of the standouts this year. Um, gosh, I just, read, I just read a great book. Um, uh, Pretty Little Wife by Darby oh, Queen. That's, that looks great. That book looks great. It was oh, so good. So and I, I know Darby a little bit. And um, I read her book in a day, gave it to my mom, who is a, what I call <laughs> a domestic noir. So like someone on your street is dead. Who did it? Right. Um, right. And it was so good. I knew my mom would love it because it was like bloody and, you know, <laughs> creepy. And so I'm like, mom, you would love this book. And now I want your mom's book list too. <laughs> <laughs> If there's like you know a missing child, my mom has read it. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I I gave it to her, and then she did like a little mini book review, and I sent it to Darby. I'm like, my mom, if my mom says it's good, you know it's really good. So again, some uh, some book recommendations. Lisa Scodelini is so good, Ooh. and uh, the Golden Retriever. All right, you can pitch her to me. We'll see. <laughs> I've seen pictures of that golden retriever and it's very, very cute. <laughs> this is so, I can't believe it's been an hour. This yeah, is so, it just flew by. Last wow. hour. I had to look up Henry Golden because I didn't know who he was. Now oh, I, are you so glad you did? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go watch Crazy Rich Asians now. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. that <laughs> I can watch that movie multiple times. I think yeah, it's, so it's just it's so a fun. beautiful feast for the senses. Such a good thing. Great book. Also great book, great, great series, yes. Yeah, Thank yeah. You so much, Kristen and Samaya. This is such a great conversation. You hit everything, every nail on the head. Um, Thank you. Why we should read this book. Click that green button and pre-order Samaya's book. It's coming yes. out at the end of the month next week, I think. Um, yeah. and this is so yeah, good. Thank you both so much. Congratulations. And um, yeah, support your local indie. What would your life yes. be without them? It would be so Absolutely. depressing not to have an unlucky story to go to one of the prettiest bookstores I've ever been in. So mm -hmm. thank you for having me. And we hope we get you for your next book next year. Hopefully it'll be in person and we can have another luncheon. That would be lovely. <laughs> lovely. Thank you everyone. Have a great thank night. You. Take care.